What's up, everybody? This is Adi once again from Gate 7 International. Another deep dive for you guys. This one is going to be about the highly anticipated Philip Zinkernagel from Nottingham Forest and Watford. He spent his last season on loan at Nottingham Forest, owned by Watford, who we purchased him from. And the fee was reported for a nice 2 million euros. So we're really excited about this. And before I jump into the deep dive, as always, guys, if you haven't done so already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Hit that notification button at the bottom if you want to get more of these deep dives. There's more coming up. We've got Abu Bakar Kamara, who has just finished his medical, we've been told, and should be signing soon. There's other names that are on the horizon that could be joining us. So don't miss a chance don't miss these deep dives don't miss all the content that's coming up today we finished up a lovely interview with paul taylor uh, about nottingham forest about philip zinkernargle so i hope you guys get a chance to listen to that and if you like and subscribe you can be on top of all of this content as it comes out and help us grow this red and white community now guys i know a lot of you have been excited about this i got some dms from some of you some of you asking i told you to wait because the deep dive was coming, and here it is. I'm getting these out as fast as I can. There's more on the way. And then once this is done, maybe I'll finally get to sleep again. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's get started. Philip Zinkernagel, Danish attacking mid and winger. Right-footed, by the way. Some of you uh, seem to disagree on social media about this, but I can confirm he is right-footed. 27 years of age, will be turning 28. Uh, before the turn of the new year F coming in at about five foot nine inches 175 centimeters not the tallest but still a good size good good height uh for an attacking mid 70 kilograms 154 pounds this is a little bit leaner than uh, we see a lot of players not that it's necessarily a bad thing and remember guys this weight is as of last season so it hasn't yet been updated he could have filled in by then some some people seem to panic when i give the weights why scout doesn't update it as frequently as some of you seem to think it's more like once or twice a season moving on Zinkernago has spent most of his career as a right wing. So a lot of time he spent on that right wing. But last season for Nottingham Forest, he played primarily as an attacking midfielder. Zinkernago played right behind the two strikers or in some cases behind the striker with uh, three, three defenders, behind, three center backs behind him. So it was a different setup. Now the season before that, when he helped Watford secure promotion to the Premier League, he actually played as a center mid. Philip Taylor in the interview that we had with him today also mentioned this. So he has played in a lot of different positions, played as a center mid deeper, kind of a center mid staying on the right for Nottingham Forest. We saw him play as an attacking mid. He also played on the right wing for them. He also played a couple games as center forward. So he's been moved around kind of all over the place. Now, what we what we like that we saw really early on in the deep dive from Philip is his level of effort off the ball. Guys, we are talking David Fuster level effort and hustle. Some people on social media, when we first brought up uh, in the teaser that he reminded me a little bit of David Fuster, people were kind of talking about, oh, he's a lot more technical than David Fuster. I think some of you are forgetting how good David Fuster was for us. Yeah, he wasn't fancy. He didn't do the uh, dribbles that some of you guys like to see. But David Fuster was quite a technical player as well. We can't short him on that. He runs. He likes to run. Uh, very good at getting into spaces, just like Yorgos Masuras. Uh, presses defenders very well. So a lot of good stuff you like to see. This is the type of characteristics that we see from players that become beloved by the fans immense effort that you could see in the tape in most games a lot of his goals just to just to elaborate on that a couple of the goals that he had last season were were created by him running through efforts or just pressuring players relentlessly he also has a, a very good shot with his off foot with his left foot so you like to see that too i was very surprised i almost forgot that he was right footed a couple of times 
in terms of his general position, when he, when we're in the attacking third, he kind of likes to sit around the top of the 18 yard line, top of the penalty box. Uh, just seems to be his preference. Not that he won't crash or move into the penalty area uh, when the run of play calls for it. He does when there's context, when something's building up or when when people are in stride and he's running alongside the ball handler. He will go, he will go further in. He will go to try to get a rebound. But generally we see that if play is moving around, he kind of likes to sit right there on the line at the edge of the penalty box. Dribbling ability is pretty solid. He doesn't have too many fancy tricks in his repertoire. Maybe a step over once in a while. He does have a nice little cut in, especially if he's sitting coming on the left side. He can cut in really nicely for with his right foot. The ball stays pretty close to him. He's got a decent center of gravity. Maybe not as close of a center of gravity like Cosas Fortunis as a, as a barometer, but pretty good overall decently agile guy but we're not we're not looking at really quick turns of pace here that we've lauded some other players with uh that's not really where his value is but the constant movement is where his value is he can turn he has decent reflexes to get around a defender here and there but this constant off the ball movement he has and, and the progressive movement is really where the value is and we'll elaborate on that later in terms of his upside down the field it's relatively moderate. Um, we do see uh, occasions where he he plays plenty of balls down down through the the center backs. So it is there, uh, albeit a little bit inconsistently, but it is there. Uh, that's the general profile of the player. I mean, really, the effort is what stood out to me the most, and this is something we love to see because a guy like David Fuster who maybe wasn't a world beater in terms of his his dribbling skill or what he could do with the ball at his feet but his his effort his non-stop running pressing box to box made us fall in love with him because we love to see people that just leave it all on the field for us now let's move on you guys know the drill here we're going to start off with his goal threat and how he looks there and once again, I did what I've done in previous deep dives, which is do a side-by-side -side comparison. So I took Phillips' goal creation statistics and I compared them to the closest player that I could find that mimicked kind of what he does in the spaces he occupies, and that's Agibu Kamara. Agibu Kamara plays as a 10 for us. He's also played on the wing for us. And I decided that maybe this is probably the closest thing to compare him with. So here you go. We see we have them side by side. Zinker Nagel, of course, the data is coming from the English Championship versus Agibus that are coming from not just the Europa League and the Champions League, but from Greece as well. And looking here, we see some similarities. They're pretty close in terms of their non penalty goal creation with. Uh, XG, non-penalty XG kind of being edged out by Philip. Philip seems to have a lot more shots. He also gets a little bit more in terms of his uh, assist creation and overall just in terms of that shot creation on a whole. So that aside, when we look deeper at the film and the data surrounding him, I saw a few things. So regarding his goals, I didn't see a really much come from set pieces. He takes a lot of set pieces, which is the reason for that most likely, but everything from him came from open play, e open play. Every single goal was from open play. Many was were resulting from his runs into position during the run of play. A couple of great solo efforts, him dribbling past the defender after receiving a one, two pass driving into space, beating the defender and ripping a shot. He likes to take these shots right on the edge of the 18. So many of his shots, I want to say close to 80% of the shots this guy takes are if they're not on the edge of the penalty box, they're, they're a little bit past it or just inside all right in that spot. Regarding his assist creation, how he creates opportunities for the team, it's there's multiple facets. He's not a one-trick pony in this regard, which we do like to see. On his good days, with his constant movement, he'll take the ball to the byline, play it in the middle for a runner that's coming in. He'll play cutting through balls once in a while if he's receiving it and he's got runners going in behind the defenders. He can see that relatively consistently. Um, he can also draw a defender at an angle 
Uh, he'll come to the edge of the penalty box, draw them to him, giving space for some of his runners. He he does that pretty frequently. I mean, guys, on his good days, it's just like Paul Taylor said. He seems like, I mean, he seems like he's unstoppable. I, I mean, there were a couple of games where it just felt like he was the only person creating. Uh, on his bad days, he does disappear. Paul said that there were days, you know, you felt like he, he wasn't there. It was kind of inconsistent. I did see that. But even on his bad days, I'll say he was usually good for for at least one or two decent shot creations or decent chances a game. Crossing volume, not quite there, even though he has a decent cross. But seeing the type of player he is and the type of runs he likes to make, Maybe that's why. Also, remember, he played primarily as an attacking mid, which could be why his crossing volume was low. Even in the games I saw him play for Watford, and this could be because he played a little bit deeper, I did not see too much in the in the way of crossing volume from him. Moving on from his goal creation, we I took a good look at his possession and build-up stats because if he's going to be playing as a number 10 for us in any respect, I wanted to see what he could do. Now, we know, I'm going to repeat this, we know that the club has said they were looking at him as a winger, so we I don't really know if this is going to be really anything that's valuable going forward, but I still took a look at it anyway. And again, if we take him side by side from Agibu, we see a couple of things here. One, most notably, Agibu has much higher pass accuracy than he does. Uh, more volume from Agibu. In not just in terms of his pass attempts, but in terms of his progressive his progressive actions, uh, Agibu has overall more progressive actions. Um, the the one thing that Zinkernagel seemed to edge Agibu out on were his dribbles. Uh, he definitely has a penchant to do more. He's more willing to take players on than Agibu was. He's also, they're, they're about the same in terms of their dribble success. Agibu, I think, was a little bit better. But we did see many more cases of Zinker Nagel willing to take those players on versus Agibu more or less did it out of necessity. Uh, and then their, in terms of their volume in the box, it's very, very close. So watching the film, looking at how he carries the ball in buildup, looking at how he does things, he in a way, it does remind me of, of Costas Fortunis. I know I kind of brought up earlier that Fortunis kept the ball a little bit closer and was a little bit more crisp with his dribble. And that's it's very true. I mean, his his control isn't as close as Fortuny. He, I don't think he's as technically gifted as Fortuny is, but you can you'll see the similarities on the field. I saw it in I saw it in the film. It's there, albeit at a lesser extent. Um this might sound a little weird, but he, I was I was impressed with how he fared physically. We know that the championship is a physical place. And the reason this is weird is because his success rate in offensive duels when he gets closed down is only about 40%. It's not terrible, but it's not amazing. So when you look at that out front, you're like, okay, Adi, you're, you, you're impressed by it, but he's losing the ball more than he keeps it. But in most of these scenarios where he loses the ball, I thought that these were clear fouls against him. We know that the championship is known for being very physical. A lot of things maybe, you know, in English football, especially that get let go, that maybe don't get let go in other leagues. Maybe that's a reason for it. But uh, seriously, guys, I most of these scenarios where he gets pushed off the ball, I mean, some of these were just clear fouls. I have no idea they, how they weren't called. In terms of his one-on-one -on -one dribble success, it's much better than how he holds the ball up, uh, which is kind of funny. You don't see that too often. But his one-on-one -on -one dribbles, it's pretty good. It's a little over 50%, which is is decent. Um, of course, not not a world beater, but pretty good for what we're looking at. Again, same same thing, failures due to what a lot of what I thought were fouls. Uh, the guy loves pass and move. In buildup, he's always looking to see you know, who he can make that quick pass to, how he can make the run so he can get the ball back. So he'll he'll make these passing moves, especially on his good days, at where the volume, where he wants the volume, he constantly wants the ball. You just see him passing, moving around, trying to get behind the defenders. Literally, it's like another Masudas, which we desperately need on this team. And 
uh, he will. He also is the guy that can be the outlet for the give and go, where a player will give him the ball and he'll he'll reward the effort as well. Not quite as often, but he does do it. Uh, he can play one touch. I saw him get in many scenarios where there were one and two touch situations, and he does it. I always like to see when players can do one and two touch. You guys know that about me. Where I see variance is in the, his touch counts game to game. There are games where he'll touch the ball 30, 40 times or more. There are games where he barely attempts 20 passes. So this, I think, is the type of variance that Paul was talking about in the interview we had with him because he discussed that there were games where he just seemed like he wasn't really there and then some he was this is the type of variance that leads to that because there are games where he's just part of everything. And then he would have games where he just was more of a peripheral character. If we, if we do indeed sign him as a winger, I think this will be less noticeable because if he's not a 10, maybe he's less integral and he can just be making those runs like Masuras and, that's not going to be something we talk about, but at playing as an attacking mid, this is something I noticed. And if he does play as an attacking mid, and that's what we want to use him for, this could be concerning as we tend at Olympiacos, we do tend to expect heavier volume and involvement from our attacking mids. This was one of the criticisms we had of Agi Bukamarab that the fact that he couldn't handle, we didn't think that he could handle that increased capacity or the, the increased ball number of balls to his feet commanding that in that position for us maybe he was too young so we'll see how that is going forward again if he's being signed as a winger this is going to be a whole hullabaloo for nothing but listen we'll see what happens moving on lastly of course we we look at his defensive ability now for a lot more of these attacking players these forward players we're not super concerned with with a lot of that only insofar as he can press for us and what he does trying to help us win the ball back. And we see here same same type of volume when it comes to closing players down in terms of the number of pressures, his defensive duels. He and Agibu are right about the same. They both have a very similar success rate uh, with Agibu kind of edging him out. Agibu also, we know, pretty high interceptions. Agib was very good at telegraphing these passes. Zinkernagel is okay at it, but he's definitely not as good as Agibu. Um, a handful more of shot blocks. You know, both of them aren't really uh, involved too much in that. Agibu with a few more clearances, tracking back better to Agibu, slightly better, uh, slightly more aerial duels won. Agibu's Success rate in those aerial duels is also better than Zinkernagel. But again, I'm going to point out here, Agibu is one of the things we touted about Agibu's ability is his defensibility and how well he gets us into those counters. If you guys remember against Fenerbahce, we saw the best out of Agibu in that mid block where he had the freedom he would sit back kind of at the center the center circle and he was given the freedom to 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 do as he saw fit with regards to where the ball was played he if he saw something he could act on it and he created some counters great counters for us that led to goals so none of this is really a knock on Zinkernago. he's he's not really that type of what maybe what you would consider like a box to box attacking mid or a defensive attacking mid in that respect he does really good in build up and he will press he's just not maybe not as effective as agibu and that's not necessarily a bad thing where he is effective in a lot of things is is a, a lot of these progressive actions and his runs off the ball receiving the ball one stat you didn't see up there that he does beat out agibu in and uh, we have a small sample set really to to gauge that because Y Scout doesn't track it. We have to track it with other other methods. And it's receiving progressive passes. He receives a lot more of those than Agibu does, which indicates that he's running forward and helping us get presenting the option to progress the ball forward, which is something that we were sorely lacking. So, uh, you know, the in terms of his his defense, we. As far as I'm concerned, the fact that I saw him pressing quite intently, I'm happy with that. He does track back really well as well, and he might not be as good on the defensive side of things for Agibu, but what's going to be valued by Coach Pedro Martins is the fact that he tracks back and he makes the effort to get back. That is what counts, and that is what's being looked for here. So 
we're getting to the part now. We've gone through some of the specifics with him, some of the data. We've gone through some of what the film shows. And here is the question that all of you ask me, and I'm going to answer a little bit differently here. And the the question with this is, is this the number 10 that will take us to Europe? Or is this the winger that will take us to Europe? The club reportedly is looking at him as a winger. And at the very least, he makes a lot of these inside runs, these runs behind the defender, just like Masuras does. He did it as an attacking mid, and in the a lot of the occasions he played a little bit wider. I saw him do it there too. At the very least, he's presenting himself for these give and goes and offering us that forward movement that we didn't previously have. If he's playing as the 10, will he take us to Europe? If, if he plays consistently at his... At the level we see that he can play, of course he can. His effort level, he could he could be as as loved as David Fuster if he keeps that up. The question will be is if he can maintain that consistency. That was a concern that Watford had, and that's a concern that maybe Steve Cooper had, according to Paul Taylor. If Steve Cooper really wanted Zinkernagel, he would have kept him. But there is some reason why he doesn't believe he's ready for the Premier League. Perhaps it's the consistency. Maybe it's a few other things. Maybe it's the fact that he's not as amazing on the defensive side of things. Maybe it's the fact that he's not maybe the most talented 10 we've seen. The way I look at it is, is he an upgrade over some of what we've seen last year? And in the film, I can say yes. Just his forward movement and forward momentum presents something that we didn't have much of last season. In that respect, that gives that gets, takes us to his value proposition. What is his value proposition? And that's it. The value proposition is in his effort. He's got enough technical ability to where I could say he can be effective, even breaking down defenses in Greece. Because with his ball movement and pass and move, that's how you break down these teams that park the bus on you. That's how you break down the Larisas, the, the Panetolikos. The well, maybe Paratolikos was probably a little bit more forward moving, but the Adromitoses, the Ionikoses of the Greek League, guys that are sitting back and happy to wait for us to come to them. You need guys that are w- to, willing to make these moves that try and stretch the defense out. And he does that, he does a lot, he moves a lot. And we've seen the kind of some useless tens that we've had or useless players like that in the past. Do you guys remember Tiago Silva, a guy that would see that would be passing, be in the center, have 50 to 60, 70 touches a game, but most of it was lateral. He would go do three stepovers in front of a defender just to make a lateral pass. This isn't that guy. He's got a lot more intent, a lot more forward intent in his passes. The risk is the consistency. I saw it in the film. Paul Taylor mentioned it to you. These are the risks with him. Now, the guys played in the championship. The championship is no joke. Very physical league. And he did well for Watford. When they got promoted, he did well for Nottingham Forest to help get them promoted. As far as I'm concerned, if he can do that in the championship, which I I consider to be a tougher league than the Super League, I'll be honest with you, at the very least, he has something to offer us in Greece. For me, in Champions League ball, You don't necessarily have to be the most gifted player to make an impact, but you do have to run your butt off. You do have to run. You do have to help present opportunities to help the team get the ball forward. We had none of that. How many games do you guys remember where we seemed like we were flat and nobody was moving? How many games we saw six guys standing in a line in the offensive line? His movement is positive to me. And I think at the very least, we have somebody, again, like Yorgos Masuras, that will make some of these moves, that will help present opportunities, that will get the ball forward positively. I think this was a good signing. And if the reported $2 million that we heard about uh, was is true, I'd rather spend $2 million on him than $5 million on Onyekuru. I would do it again and again. So I'm I'm positive on this guy. I think this was a solid signing. I think this is going to pay dividends in Greece at the very least. And But overall, I think his effort level is going to be what really helps in some of these European games. Paul Taylor also made some mention about, you know, uh, I don't want to say attitude issues, but speaking his mind. 
I don't know how that will work with Pedro Martins. It also depends on how he speaks his mind. Pedro Martins, we know kind of you have a little bit of an ego with him. You're gone. It's happened with some players already. Who says it can't happen with more? So I don't know how that's going to impact this. So I'm basing it off of what I saw on the field. And what I did see on the field from him, I like. And I, I see a lot less risk with this. I don't think this is a very risky, even at $2 million because – the, the type of player he is and the effort level that's there, barring a major injury, I think this guy has what it takes to make a real impact for Olympiacos. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed the latest deep dive. Like I said, there's more coming because the signings keep coming, apparently. And so do, so do the, the Cotsis 12 o'clock transfer specials about who we're looking at, too. So it seems like my work's not done for me yet. Don't forget, hit that like and subscribe button. If you like what you hear here, if you like the content that we're bringing, hit that bell as well so you can be notified anytime that we go live again. And most importantly, guys, help us grow this red and white community. It gets bigger and bigger every day. And we connect more and more Olympiacos fans. And I got to tell you, it's amazing when you go someplace and somebody, somebody that's an Olympiacos fan recognizes you and says, hey, you're that Gate 7 guy, or you're an Olympiacos fan too. It's something that brings us together. It's already happened a couple times to me. I love it. I love it. It's fantastic, and we're building this together. It's not me. It's not the other guys at Gate 7 National. It's us. All of us together are doing this. And in order to keep it growing, this is what we have to do. We like, subscribe, comment, engage, get the algorithm to keep pushing us up so everybody can see us. So help us. Hit those buttons, follow us on social media, and interact with us and help us continue to grow this so we can make it even bigger and better than it already is. As always, guys, Gate 7 International is brought to you by the fans for the fans. I'm a fan. Everybody here is a fan. We don't get paid to do this. We do this because we love our team. We love Olympiacos. And we know you guys do too. So we look forward to continuing to do this. We have so much fun. We have so much fun with you guys. And... We can't wait to do it. That's why I do these deep dives. That's why the, we do these shows. So until next time, boys and girls, I'm Adi. This is Gate 7 International, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Until the next deep dive, and I look forward to sleeping one day. Oh, 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 oh,